I asked him, I said, Senator, you've met heads of state, presidents, Supreme Court justices. What's the most exciting thing to ever happen to you? And he thought for a minute, he looked at me and he said, well, Sonny boy, I hope it hadn't happened yet. Okay, you stumbled in to fill in the blanks. And you know, when I said fill in the blanks, I meant fill in different kinds of blanks. Sometimes it's fill in the blanks in other people's lives, but this time I'm starting a series where I'm talking about filling in the blanks in your lives. Not somebody else's lives, your lives. This is a series that I want you to get something out of. Look, I can't sing, I can't dance, I can't even draw a straight line. So that means when I talk to somebody, they got to get something out of it because you're not looking at me for eye candy. And like I say, I can't entertain you with singing or dancing. So what is it I want you to get out of this? I want you to get out of this fill in the blank series, an edge. I want you to get an edge in your life. And here's the first edge I want you to get. I want you to be able to figure out who you are and how you got to be who you are, where you are. Now think about that. You know what you do. You know what your job is. You're a mom, you're a dad, but you're a baker, a candlestick maker, you're an accountant or an architect or a teacher. That's what you do. That's not who you are. So I want you to know who you are, and more importantly, how you got to be there. And I'm going to tell you how we're going to figure this out. All right, now to help you figure out that distinction, I've got to give you some tools to do that, okay? The first thing I'm going to ask you to do is move your position. To understand what I mean by that, I want you to fill this sentence in for me. How would you complete this sentence? I would rather be right than blank. Think about that. I'd rather be right than blank. Now, I guarantee you 90% plus of you Finish that sentence this way. You said, I'd rather be right than wrong. Of course, you'd rather be right than wrong. Nobody wants to be wrong. If you're in an argument or you're picking out something, you always want to be right. So you'd finish that sentence, I'd rather be right than wrong. I want you to move your position just for the time that you're listening to me today and for the rest of this Living by Design series. What I want you to do is think about it differently. I want you to finish the sentence this way. I don't want you to say, I'd rather be right than wrong. What I want you to say is, I would rather be happy than right. Now, that's very different. I would rather be happy than right. Look, we have enough right fighters. We got enough people out there that are right, 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 right. They're always right, always got to be right. God, don't you get sick of those people that are right all the time. I don't want you to be one of those. I don't want you to be right. I want you to be happy. I mean, you might get in an argument with your kid and say, get a haircut, no tattoos, shut up, do what I tell you. You may be right because you're the parent, but does it make you happy? Does it make your family happy? So I'm going to ask you to move your position just for the time we're talking. Instead of being so committed to being right, In terms of evaluating everything I talk to you about in terms of whether what I'm telling you is right or wrong, what I want to ask you to do is look at it in terms of whether what I'm telling you makes you happy. You can be right again as soon as we finish, as soon as you turn me off, get out of your car, finish your walk, go back, do whatever you want to do. You can go back to being right. But as long as we're talking Look at everything I ask you to consider in terms of whether or not what you're doing in your life currently and what I might ask you to do in your life moving forward, does it make you happy? I don't care if it makes you right. What I care, does it make you happy? So I'm going to ask you to move your position from being right to being happy. And you know what? That might just stick. You just might decide, you know what? I've been right all my life. It's time to be happy. Now, when I say move your position, what do I mean by that? Think about it. I can say, okay, stand at the hood of your car. Now move to the trunk of your car. That's moving your position. That's what I want you to do in your attitude, your mind. I actually want you to move your position. Now, what do you have to do to affect this change from being right to being happy? Well, 
Let's call roll because I want everybody here that needs to be there in order for this to happen. And I got some good news and some bad news. It's a short list. Because the good news is the only person you need to make this change is you. The bad news is the only person you need to make this change is you. Now, why is that bad news? Because you can't blame anybody. You're not a victim. You can't say, well, my wife's got to change. My husband's got. No, they don't. No, they don't. They can do whatever they want to do. You have to be the one that changes your attitude. Maybe they'll change. Maybe they won't. But when I call roll on who needs to be involved for you to stop being right and start being happy, you're the only one that's involved. You're the only one that you control. And doesn't that work out well? You're the only one you need to control to change from being right to being happy. So let's just get this right. If you're going to live by design, the design is for you. Everybody else, you can inspire. I mean, you can get them all excited. Maybe they want to follow you. Maybe they don't. But the only person you control is you. So let's clean your house first. We'll worry about everybody else later. By the way, that's always been the case. You have always been the only person you've ever controlled, and you have been doing it on purpose. You may not have thought you were, but you have always done this on purpose. Now, you're probably wondering, why is a 12-year-old sitting around wondering why people do what they do and don't do what they don't do? I remember the split second I became obsessed with that. We had a football game rain out when I was like 12 years old. And we usually play on Saturdays. It was a big rainstorm. So we got rained out. And on Monday, the phone rings and the Salvation Army calls. And they say to our coach, look, we've got a team over here. and We don't get to play all that much. And we saw that you guys had your game rain out on Saturday. Could we come over and play a scrimmage game with you on Monday? And the coach says, well, sure, of course we will. Now, look, I got to tell you, we're pretty cocky. We think we're good and we look good. I mean, we got the best unit. Oh, they're black with these silver stripes down the side and black helmets and black wristbands. We think we're really bad, okay? So these guys pull up from the Salvation Army in like three pickup trucks, and it looked like the grapes of wrath out there. Now, you may be too young to remember that, but that was back in the Dust Bowl. These kids start falling out of the back of these pickups. Nothing matches. They don't have jerseys. None of the helmets match. And the kid that lines up across from me, he's got on a button-up shirt for a jersey. And the number on the shirt is four, and it's on in masking tape. Now, I'll tell you how snotty we were. We're in the huddle back there saying, look at this. I mean, what? that's going to come off. Why didn't he do it in Magic Marker? Well, he didn't do it in Magic Marker because that was his shirt. That wasn't one of his shirts. That was his shirt. He had to wear that to school the next day. That's why he put the number on in masking tape. Football pants? He had no football pants. He rolled his blue jeans up to his knees so they looked like football pants. Football shoes? No football shoes. He had on loafers. So, We've got all this fancy uniforms and equipment. We're thinking we're so bad. And here's this ragtag team. Number four lined up across from me. And I got to tell you, when they snapped that ball, that kid hit me so hard, it still hurts when it rains. He hit my shoulder. I thought I'd been hit by a truck. And I got to tell you, over the next hour, they beat us like they were clapping for a barn dance. It was like a track meet. We probably got beat 50 to nothing. These kids ran over us like we were nothing. It finished up, and I crawl over to the car to get in. I looked at my dad and said, what the hell happened? And he said, well, boy, you just got your ass handed to you on a platter. That's what happened. I said, well, yeah, Dad, thanks a lot. I was hoping for a little more in-depth analysis than that. And he said, son, those boys are hungry. Those boys just wanted it more than you did. That's what happened. And right there, that moment, I became envious of those kids from the Salvation Army. In that moment, I thought, I want what they have. That seems so funny because here I was, we had all the equipment, we had grass on the field. These kids had nothing. But they were so hungry. I mean, they had that eye of the tiger inside. And I remember sitting there in the car, hurting every part of me, hurting, thinking, you know what? If they can do so much with so little, how much should I be able to do with so much? 
And I thought, I want what they have. Those kids were hungry. They had this this desire, this just, I want it. And when they got a chance to play, when they got a chance to be on grass, they wanted to seize that moment, and they ate our sack lunch, I got to tell you. And it wasn't just that day, because I made friends with some of those kids, and they weren't sitting around feeling sorry for themselves. They went the extra mile every time they got a chance. Trust me, if you do something in pattern, if you do something that's part of your personality, you do it because it's what you want, because you get a payoff from it. And these kids got a payoff from being hungry. They got a payoff from being committed. You get a payoff from it some way. And if you don't get something out of it, trust me, you don't continue to do it. Your life won't be made up of things that don't pay you off in some way. Now, you may think, no way, Dr. Phil, I'm not getting a payoff for this. I'm miserable. Look, I'm not saying it's a healthy payoff, but I'm saying you're getting a payoff. It may be a sick payoff. You may be sitting on the sideline watching life go by, and your payoff is you don't have to face the pressure of getting in the game. You don't have to face the risk of getting out of your comfort zone. That is a payoff. Is it healthy? No, but it is a payoff. It's a pathological payoff, but it's a payoff. You don't do something that you don't get something out of. You do what you do in your life because in some way you're getting a payoff out of it. What I want you to do is start living by design. I want you to have a definition of what success is in your life. So one of the things I'm going to be asking you to do as we move through living by design is figuring out what your payoffs are. Look for things you do in pattern and then say, what am I getting out of this? Healthy, sick, otherwise, what's my payoff? Because when you identify the payoff, then you can control the currency. And when you control the currency, then you control you. Once you know what your payoff is, You can turn that spigot on and you can turn that spigot off and that will change what you're doing. It will change how you're living. Whatever you do, whoever you are, do that on purpose. Don't just be who you are, live whatever life you live by accident. I mean, come on, own it. You get to the end of your life and somebody says, what did you do with your life? At least say, whatever I did, I did it on purpose. Live by design. Make a plan and choose what you're doing. And what I want to do here, when we finish this series, I want you to have a plan that you can get excited about. That's what I'm wanting you to do. That's why I want you to listen to this fill-in-the-blank series about you, because I want us to come away with a plan that you can get excited about. Now, here's what I want you to do. Write down today's date. but put next year. Put this day and this month, but put next year. And I'm going to tell you why. Because I want that in your calendar so this time next year, you look at that date and you remember me telling you today that one year from today, your life is going to be better or worse than it is today. It's not going to be the same. You're going to be happier or sadder, richer or poorer, fatter or skinnier, married or divorced, but it is not going to be the same. Your life is going to be better or worse a year from now than it is right now. And a huge part of that is going to be a function of choices you make between now and then. And let me give you some bad news. Now that you've heard me say that, you're totally screwed. You cannot not choose. Because not choosing is a choice. Think about it this way. Picture a crossroads out in the middle of the country. Okay? A big crossroads out in the middle of the country. Think about it. There's just, it's just two highways crossing each other in the middle of the country, and you come to that crossroads. What are your choices? You can go straight ahead. You can make a U-turn and go back. You can turn left, or you can turn right, or you can say, nope, 
not going to choose, just going to stand right here in the middle of the intersection and just let life vroom, run right over me. Well, that's your fifth choice, but you cannot not choose. You are going to make choices, and I'm just saying own them. Since you're going to make a choice anyway, you might as well make a conscious choice. So I'm just saying, let's get active about some things. Let's get active about choosing. Don't just kind of choose by not choosing. Since you're going to make the choices anyway, do it on purpose. Live on purpose. Be on purpose. I'm going to give you some things to help you. The first book I wrote was back in, I don't know, 98. I don't know. You probably can't even buy it anymore. So I'm going to put it on the website, the things I'm talking about, so you don't have to. But I wrote something called Life Strategies. And in Life Strategies, I talked about the 10 laws of life. When I talk about laws, I'm not talking about tendencies or guidelines. Like these are things that happen sometimes and sometimes they don't. I'm talking about laws. And when you talk about laws, it's like the laws of physics. What's a law of physics? Gravity. Gravity is a law of physics. It's there every day. It's a law. You have it. It's a law of gravity. You don't get up some mornings and say, eh, you know, do I want gravity today or not? It's there every day. Give it a try. Go step on the edge of your roof and step off and see if gravity is there every day. You can test it out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It's going to be there every day. And you're going to figure that out just as you hit the ground. It's a law. It's not a guideline, not a trend. It's not a tendency. And there are laws of life that are the same way. Now, in case you're unbelievably concrete, I really don't mean go get on your roof and step off and test gravity. I'm just using that as an example. What do they say? Don't try this at home. Don't go step off your roof. I'm just using that as an example. You know what? I wrote the first law of life when I was 16 years old. Now, I'm not some prodigy. I didn't at 16 say, oh, here's the first law of life. But in looking back, I learned the first law of life when I was 16 years old. I was working at Hallmark Cards in Kansas City. Y'all probably know Hallmark's based in Kansas City, and I was working at Hallmark Cards in Kansas City. I was on the four to midnight shift, and my job was to tear stuff up. They were really big into human resources back then, so they matched personalities to jobs. They gave me a sledgehammer and a dumpster, and I was supposed to tear shit up. I came in every day, put these dies that they printed the cards from on the corner of a dumpster and hit it with a three-pound sledgehammer. That was my job. I thought, how long could this job last? How many could they have? I think they had about 10 million of them. And they said, okay, now you're not going to have supervision because you're here from four to midnight and it's really noisy. We're going to put you off in this warehouse. You're mature enough to work without supervision, are you? I looked at him like, I can't believe you even asked me that. Are you kidding me? So as soon as they leave, I have a buddy come down and we decide we're going to build a hot rod. And I'm talking now, guys, you're going to love this. 1966 Chevelle Super Sport 396 375 horse. We had a custom manifold sitting on top of this engine with three Holly carburetors on it. We had headers, some cheater slicks on the back. And if you roll this car backwards just a little bit and pop the clutch, you could pull the front wheels off the ground about four inches. We would go out at midnight and find people, and we would race them. We treated stupidity like it was a virtue. <laughs> now, because this was stupid, it would be indiscreet for me to name my friend, Steve Dillman. We would go up and down Main Street and Broadway in downtown Kansas City at 120 miles an hour trying to sucker people into racing us. So on this given night, we're flying down there. It's the Christmas holidays, and we each have a buddy in town. And we're flying along there and look in the rearview mirror, and there is a cop on our bumper at 120 miles an hour in downtown Kansas City. Now, this is when they had M-Squad. You're too young to remember, but they used to have a TV show called M-Squad, Metro Squad. These were the badass cops. We look in the rearview mirror, and this cop is on our bumper. And when I say on our bumper, you couldn't have gotten a gum wrapper between his bumper and ours. This was an era where they didn't like stay in the car, call for backup, fill out a bunch of paperwork. No, they pull us over, say, get out. So just as they pull us over, Steve's buddy from out of town slithers out the back window and runs between the buildings. He takes off. I'm thinking, oh, God, this isn't good. 
This cop lines us up like crows on a clothesline. We're standing at attention beside the car. And he walks up to Dillman and says, all right, I'm going to ask you one time, what's the name of that boy that run off? And Dillman looks him straight in the eye and says, yeah, well, his name was Sam Sausage. What of it? Oh, my God, I'm thinking that cop hit him so hard, I thought it broke my nose. He dropped him like a hundred-pound rock. Bam, right there on the asphalt. Now, here's the problem. The next guy in line is my friend, and then I'm next. And the problem is, neither of us know that guy's name. He's run off, and the only person that knows his name is unconscious on the pavement. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. I'm coming up next here. I wish I knew his name. I'd give him his social security number. I'd give him his fingerprints. I'd give him whatever he wanted, but no chance. He steps up to my friend next and he says, all right, I'm going to ask you one damn time. What's the name of that boy that run off? Well, my friend, having somewhat of a brain, says, "Uh, sir, if I may, I swear on my mother's grave. We had just had lunch with her that afternoon. She was not dead. He says, I swear on my mother's grave, I do not know that young man's name, but I can promise you it ain't Sam Sausage. I don't know his name, but it ain't Sam Sausage. Now, right then, right then, bam, I wrote life law number one. You either get it or you don't. Dillman, who's kissing the pavement, he don't get it. My friend and I, who are still vertical and still have all of our dental work, we get it. You don't mess with somebody like this. We get it. And I wrote the first law of life right then. I didn't know it at the time, but in retrospect, I figured out that night you either get it or you don't. Now, don't you know people in your life who don't get it? I'll give you a minute. Make a list. Maybe you start with your in-laws. I don't know, but don't you know people who just don't get it? They just stumble through life. They just don't seem to know where they're going. They ask asinine questions. They do stupid stuff over and over again. I don't want you to be one of those people. So what is it I want you to get? I want you to get that you need to take care of you so you can take care of other people. I want you to take care of you so you can be a gift to your family. I want you to not be one of those people that stumbles around in life. I want you to be one of the people that says there is a consequence to every behavior, and I get that, so when I choose the behavior, I realize I choose the consequence. And I realize I cannot not choose. Now, that is just one of the 10 laws of life. I'll put the other 10 on the website. I'm not going to go through them all here for you, but I will list them. You don't need to buy the book. I'll list them for you. My dad was an alcoholic, and we did not have a great relationship. But at the end of his life, right before he died, he said something to me that I think was pretty prophetic. He was sober the last two years of his life, so we did get along a little bit better then. And right before he died, this was before I'd ever been on Oprah, before I'd ever done anything like that, he told me something that really stuck with me. He said, boy, let me tell you something. He said, I truly believe that during your life, you are going to have the opportunity to intervene in people's lives in such a way that you identify for them threshold moments in their lives that are outcome determinative in where they head, where they wind up. Because oftentimes people don't recognize the gravity of the choices they make. They don't understand when they come to the precipice of moments that can truly change the trajectory of their life. And he said, I predict that you're going to wind up in a position where you have the opportunity to help people recognize when they come to those moments in their lives. And I don't know what 
he was paying attention to or what he was really focused on at that point. But what I want you to get is I don't want you to stand at the end of your life and look back over it and say, with 2020 hindsight, I recognize now that I missed some key opportunities to change the trajectory of my family. I missed key opportunities to change the trajectory of my life. I want you to stand at the end of your life and recognize that you were alert enough, that you were situationally aware enough, that you recognize those critical choice points when they occurred. I want you to stand at the end of your life and say, you know what? I got a wake-up call that made me one of those people that gets it that made me stop stumbling through life and pay attention to what's going on so I could seize the moment, seize what's there, and live on purpose. And that's what this series is all about. Because, you know, I believe that everybody has a personal truth. You have one. I have one. Everybody has one. A personal truth is what you believe about yourself when nobody else is looking, nobody else is listening. You have a social mask. We all do. I do. You have one. It's when we put our best foot forward. We always talk about putting on our Sunday best. At least we do in the South. You know, we always dressed up to go to church. We put on our Sunday best, put on our Sunday suit, Sunday shirt, washed our face, went to church. That's your social mask. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what you believe about you when you don't have your social mask on. If you aren't honest with yourself about that, then you can't deal with reality. You can't deal with your authenticity. And here's why that's so important. We generate the results in life that we believe we deserve. So if your personal truth is damaged, if you think you're less than, if you don't think you're as smart as, as good as, if you think you're damaged in some way, you're going to generate results that second-class people should have. If you look at people that are really successful in business or really happy in their marriage and family and you say secretly, well, that's for them, that's not for me. I don't really deserve that, then you'll never generate that. If you have a damaged personal truth, you will generate a lifestyle, a standard of living mentally, emotionally, physically, financially, socially, that goes along with being damaged. Now, I know that because I grew up with a damaged personal truth because my father was a bad alcoholic. And... The problem that kids make is they compare their personal truth with other people's social mask. So I would go to school knowing that our utilities were turned off last night. I would go to school knowing that my father came home drunk and got violent in the kitchen with my mother and sisters. I would go to school knowing that the car had been repossessed And the windows had been kicked out of the house. And compare myself to the kid in the next row who had a clean shirt on and a scrubbed face and a smile and say, you know, he's a first class kid and I have all of these secrets that I don't want anybody to know. And by comparison, I always came in second. So I had a damaged personal truth. And fortunately, I was able to figure that out and heal. I was able to identify a currency at a young age that was able to validate me because I was an athlete at the time. And so I got a lot of strokes, a lot of currency, a lot of income 
for being an athlete, both in my family and outside my family. And so I started to think, well, I, I'm not just from a broken family. Actually, I have an identity as an athlete. And I was first string, first team, first this, first that. And I thought, well, that doesn't jive with being second class. So it started to create what's called cognitive dissonance within me. I had a conflict I had to resolve, and I decided to resolve it as being first class instead of second class. Now, you have to ask yourself, what is your personal truth? What do you believe about yourself? And here's how you need to do that. You need to turn your ear inward and ask yourself what you say to yourself. What's your internal dialogue? How do you label yourself? What do you say to yourself? Because if all through the day you're putting yourself down, if all through the day you're labeling yourself as a loser, all through the day you're labeling yourself as, I can't do this, I'm not going to get this done, I, I don't deserve this, until you change that internal dialogue, you're never, ever going to get the results that you truly deserve. Now, I'm going to have to put you to work here, and this is a really important assignment. Internal dialogue is so powerful because it actually gets automatic. Here's the problem. We speak at 125 words a minute. We think at 1,200 to 1,400 words a minute. Now, think about what I just said. We think 10 times faster than we talk. So you might say something out loud once. And you can think it 10 times for every one time you say it. A bully at school might say something to you that puts you down one time, and then you repeat it to yourself a thousand times over the next few days. So I need you to really turn your ear inward and listen to what you're saying to yourself. And it's not enough to just think about it. I need you to go to the website that accompanies this podcast And you'll find that at drphillintheblanks.com. For this episode, you're going to find worksheets there, and one of them is going to be labeled Internal Dialogue. I'm going to have a few examples there of what I'm talking about, what constitutes internal dialogue, and I want you to start making a list of what you say to yourself. Because until you write it down so you can get some objectivity from it, so you can step back and look at it and go, wow. No wonder I feel the way I do. No wonder I feel the way I do. If I look at this list, I'm saying this stuff to myself all day long. My God, no wonder. I'm shocked I even get out of bed in the morning if I say all this stuff to myself. And you say it as often as you do. And I want you to start testing those thoughts, testing them to see if they're rational. And what you're going to find on the website is you're going to find four criteria for a rational thought. I'm going to tell you what they are right now. Number one, if a thought is rational, it has to be grounded in objective fact. It's not opinion. It has to be grounded in objective fact. Number two, it has to be in your best interest. Number three, it has to protect and prolong your life. Number four, it has to get you closer to the healthy goals you want in your life. For something to be rational, it has to meet those four criteria. Let me repeat them again for you. Number one, if a thought is rational, it has to be grounded in objective fact. It's not opinion. It has to be grounded in objective fact. Number two, it has to be in your best interest. Number three, it has to protect and prolong your life. Number four, it has to get you closer to the healthy goals you want in your life. Now, I'm going to list those for you on the website, so they'll go right along with all of these things you just listed on internal dialogue. I want you to test each one of them against those four criteria. If it fails any one of the four, cross it off your list. You can't say that anymore, and you have to replace it with something that does meet those four criteria, so you're only saying to yourself things that are rational. 
This is a very important exercise. Don't skip this when you may be driving right now. Don't do it while you're driving. Wait till you get home, then get on the website, and then do this exercise. You will be shocked at the power of challenging the lies you're telling yourself and replacing them with rational thought. If you don't change your behaviors, you're never going to get the kind of currency that you want mentally, emotionally, and socially. And some people hide from their personal truth by being a workaholic. I was doing a life skills seminar one time, and I had a woman come up to me afterwards, and she said, you know, I was listening to everything you said, but I just, I just don't have time for it. I mean, I, I said, really? Where do you live? She said, in a white suburban. I said, what do you mean? She said, I live in a white suburban. I have four children, and they go to four different schools. One of them plays soccer, one of them plays basketball, one of them is in band, and one of them doesn't do anything. So she said, I get up in the morning, I go to four different schools, I drop them off, I pick them up, I take them to these activities and those activities, and I'm a realtor. So I'm racing around, showing homes, going here, going there, going here, going here, going there. And she said, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just burning out. She said, I just feel like I'm just going to explode any second. And I said, well, do something for me. I said, after you drop those kids off to school tomorrow, I want you to go home, turn your phone off, take the phone off the hook, lock the doors, go run a bath, even a bubble bath, get the stupidest magazines you can find, and just go spend 30 minutes relaxing in a bubble bath. She looked at me like I was insane. She said, are you kidding me? She said, oh my God, my mother would turn over in her grave. I said, oh my God, now we're living for dead people? Are you kidding me? Your mother would turn over in her grave? I said, I'll tell you what, do it every day of the week. Let's, turn, let's, let's spin her like a rotisserie chicken. I don't care if she turns over in her grave. Let's just spin her around. I don't, what, what do you care if she's dead? Give it a shot. Come on. You've got to change something. You've got to change your thinking. You've got to change your behavior. You're making choices that have consequences. I had the opportunity to interview a senator one time. I'm not going to say his name. I'm really not this time. He was one of the oldest people in Congress. And I asked him, I said, Senator, you've met heads of state, presidents, Supreme Court justices. Tell me. Everything you've done, everything you've seen, what's the most exciting thing to ever happen to you? And he thought for a minute, he looked at me, and he said, well, Sonny boy, I hope it hadn't happened yet. And I thought, wow, what a profound answer. Here's a guy that's been in Congress since Christ was a child, 50, 60 years. And he said, I hope it hasn't happened yet. How about you? How about you? I mean, if you're 40 years old, you've lived 14,000 some odd days, and life expectancy now is pushing into the 90s. Are you one of those people that if I say, what do you do for fun? And you say, well, you know, well, we used to fish. You know, we used to, we used to take a couple weeks and travel. When was the last time you did that? Oh, it's been, what, has mama been six years, seven years? Really? Last time you had fun was six or seven years ago? Well, you got 40 years left. And the last time you really gave yourself permission to have fun was six or seven years ago, and you got 40 years left? That's a long, long time to do what you're doing. That's a long time to be boring. I mean, come on. This is no dress rehearsal. You're burning daylight, man. You got to figure out. I got to redefine my life. I got to redefine this. And I'm going to end this conversation 
with one question I want you to ask yourself and just let this weigh on you a little bit. Just how much fun are you to live with? Ask yourself that. Don't ask yourself, I'm not asking you to change everything at one time. Just ask yourself this. How much fun are you to live with? The formula for a successful relationship is this. Number one, it's based on a solid underlying friendship, which means, first, what do friends do? They share things. They support each other. They laugh. They talk. They're friends. They invest. It's based on a solid underlying friendship, and it meets the needs of the two people involved. Now, think about that. It meets the needs of the two people involved. That means you've got two jobs. Job number one is to work to discover the needs of your partner. Job number two is work to teach your partner your needs. Now, if both of you are doing those two jobs, if you're working to teach your partner your needs and you're working to learn your partner's needs, then you're both teaching and learning at the same time. If he or she is both teaching and learning at the same time, then you've got two people moving towards each other. You're each trying to learn the other's needs and teach the other person your needs. All of a sudden, you're moving towards each other with the common goal of creating intimacy. That might require turning the television off. And in case you didn't know, if you have a television in your bedroom, your sex life suffers 50%. 55 zero percent. So if you want to get lucky, kick Kimmel and Fallon and Conan and Corden to the curb. Get them out of your bedroom, but ask yourself, how much fun are you to live with? When I talk about how much fun you are to live with, I don't mean just for your spouse or your kids. I mean you. I've always said if I was going to be alone, I don't want to be a bad person to do it with. So that means I got to get along with me pretty well. And here's the deal. You've probably noticed throughout this whole time that I've been talking to you that there's a common theme to what I've been saying, and that is I'm being selfish on your behalf. And you may think, boy, if I do everything he's been talking about, I'm going to feel selfish. Well, don't. Don't feel selfish when you're putting yourself first. Do not feel selfish when you're putting yourself first. Here's why. You can't give away what you don't have. If you love your children, and I know you do, then take care of their mother. Take care of their father. The last thing you want to do is mismanage yourself such that you wind up emotionally bankrupt and become emotionally unavailable or physically unavailable because you have a heart attack and die, so the people that you love and love you don't have you in their lives. You don't want to do that. you got to take care of yourself because you can't give away what you don't have. So is it selfish for you to take some time to yourself? No, not if it prolongs your life, not if it keeps you vibrant and alive so you can be there for the people that you love and love you. I don't want you to be emotionally bankrupt. If you allow yourself to get depressed and anxious and gray and burned out, then so your kids get old enough to get married and they come to you for advice. You say, I got nothing. I got nothing for you. I burned myself out because I wasn't smart enough to take a break and take care of myself. I'm sorry, I can't help you pick a wife or a husband. I can't give you advice about how to be a father or a mother because I'm, I'm burned out or I died 10 years ago and I've been absent in your life all of that time. Don't do that. You do not want to allow yourself to become emotionally bankrupt. And to do that, you got to treat yourself like a bank account. If all you ever do are make withdrawals, You never make any deposits. You are going to wind up with a zero balance. We need 
mothers, not martyrs. We need fathers, not martyrs. You've got to take care of yourself. And that means you've got to make some deposits. You've got to do some things for yourself. And that's what I've been talking about along the way here. And if you are a mother or a father and you've got kids that are five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years old, take a real close look and you're going to notice something. They have arms and legs. They can pick up their own room. They can pick up their own toys. They can even make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And nobody will call Child Protective Services if they have to make themselves a sandwich. You don't have to do everything. And here's an interesting word to put in your vocabulary. No. No, I won't take you here. No, I won't take you there. No, I won't do this. No, I won't do that. We are living in a society with entitled children. They need to hear no. Turn off the television, go outside, rake some leaves, get out in the sun, breathe some fresh air, leave them alone. You want some time alone with your spouse? Robin and I used to tell our kids, look, this door's closed. Unless one of you burst into flames, do not open this door. You have to have some time for yourself. So the theme that you've been hearing here is you've got to take care of yourself and it's not selfish because you do not want to be emotionally bankrupt. Take care of you. You deserve it. The people you love deserve it. And you're not going to believe what we talk about next week. Now, there's an accompanying web page that goes with this whole series. So when you finish listening to this, and you can listen to it as many times as you want to, but go to the website, that's drfillintheblanks.com, and you're going to find everything we talked about here there. And you're also going to find some personal inventories some checklists, some personality tests that you can take to help you find out who you are and how you got to be that person. What we're going to talk about next time is what the hell to do with what you found out today, because that's a whole other chapter. And trust me, I'm going to put verbs in my sentences. Give it some thought. We're just getting started. So long. So long.